Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Corporate Disclosure and Enforcement Impact of COVID-19 on SEC Filings. This presentation will last 60 minutes. This webinar is available for one hour of CLE in California, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. For all other states, credit will be applied for as requested. Please be advised that there will be two points during the program where we will pause for CLE verification. During this time, a code will appear. Please make sure to write this code down if you would like CLE credit as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this presentation. There will be a CLE evaluation immediately following the conclusion of the webinar at 2 p.m. Eastern. If you have questions, you can type your questions in the comments bar on the side of your screen. We will do our best to address them at the end of the program. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers today. John Carney is a former practicing CPA at a big four accounting firm, an SEC senior counsel in the Division of Enforcement, and a DOJ securities fraud chief. He has unparalleled experience investigating and defending cases involving technical accounting and disclosure issues, restatements, and allegations of financial misconduct. As a prosecutor, he successfully served as the lead counsel in the Sendent Accounting and Restatement Fraud Trial, securing a victory after a nine-month trial. As defense counsel, he constructed a bottom-up accounting defense resulting in an unprecedented non-fraud resolution in the multi-year Diebold SEC restatement matter. His expertise and knowledge of accounting issues have earned him recognition by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants as certified in financial forensics, while his skill as a courtroom advocate has resulted in favorable verdicts and national recognition as the go-to lawyer in high-stakes disclosure and accounting cases. John has been nationally recognized as one of the best securities enforcement defense lawyers in the country, and he is a frequent lecturer on accounting, auditing, and restatement issues and related trial strategy to both the private bar as well as government agencies, including the DOJ and SEC. John Harrington is a member of the firm's securities and corporate governance team based in Cleveland. He represents public companies in connection with disclosure and governance issues, as well as capital markets, M&A, and other strategic transactions. John's practice is informed by the experience and insights he gained during five years in the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance. While at the SEC, John worked in a variety of roles within CorpFin, including the Office of Capital Market Trends, Disclosure Operations, and Rulemaking. And now we'll begin today's presentation. Thanks, Kristen, and, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, this is John Harrington, so you can recognize our voices. Um, so, so look, there's been a ton of action from the SEC, state and statements, guidance, um, in a variety of formats in the in the last few weeks. Um, I think the volume of it has been really an unprecedented. Um, it, it really unprecedented in response to an unprecedented situation. Um, it's tough to keep up with. It's been kind of fast and furious. Um, and so we'll highlight some of the key points and, and some of the key statements that we think are most um, relevant, and, and we'll we'll discuss those throughout this um, this presentation. But we're not, you know, we're not going to try to um, give you an in-depth. In uh, summary of all that stuff. We put out um, summaries, and there, I know there's lots of reading material on the, on those things. What we really want to do, and we thought would be most useful, is to kind of have a more practical discussion of what it all actually means, especially as companies try to um, to one deal with this situation, its impacts on their business and their employees, um, at the same time um, preparing for their their upcoming earnings and generally comply with their obligations under the security laws. Um, um, so before we get into the slides, I think, you know, one of the things that personally I'm still trying to wrestle with is what, what does this all mean? What does, um, 
what is the SEC's goals um, in, in giving all this guidance? What are they trying to get companies to do? Um, I think, you know, from a Corp Fin perspective, I think they're trying to, to, to one, be proactive to show that they're going to be understanding and adaptable, but also remind companies that their normal obligations still apply and they're expected to live up to those. And then even beyond that, in some cases, particularly with respect to forward-looking information and, and updating obligations, which we'll talk about, um, really go above and beyond what normally might be expected. Um, John Carney, do you have any initial thoughts? Yeah, hi everyone, it's John Carney. This is, um, I've been doing this for 25 years and, and, and this is, um, un, as we see the word, un, unprecedented. I mean, never in, in, in my mind has there been so much uncertainty. And uh, when, I, when I think about it and kind of just a, a policy and an economic wonk, um, there is so much for, it's not, normally a company is dealing with, hey, am I going to meet my sales expectations? Everything else is a quiet sea around me. And do I have enough liquidity? Am I properly disclosing loss provisions, accounts, you know, accounts receivable issues? Do I have related party transactions? All of the things which are, I think, are much more, um, you know, much more addressable uh, in, a, in a comm C. And so, but here we have companies, you know, facing, and I'm, I'm looking at it just, well, my suppliers in China, will I actually have the, the actual manufacturing ability to, to, uh, to produce something? Because I'm not sure if my supply will be there. Um, my stores are closed. Um, I can't actually sell on a retail on a retail basis, and that's more than half of what I normally sell. Um, you know, my customers that buy from you know big box stores, say some electronics, is they have liquidity crisis. Are are they going to be able to to pay? Um, and you know, and again, this is by no means exhaustive. Um, but then there's situations where, well, how are my employees going to function or work? And and uh, and you know, God, uh, God willing, they're they're healthy, but you know, can they work in the same way? So I don't think I, I think that people will be studying this period of time on many levels. You know, from from you know, the way society interacts and the market, certainly the way companies you know make their disclosures. And so I think that's why we've seen, at least in my mind, I, I, and I'm always the guy. So I'm I'm in the enforcement guy. So I'm the guy that three years later. And, um, you know, everything has calmed down again and, you know, people think they're back to normal. And yet all of these plaintiffs, um, private plaintiffs have sued companies saying, oh, you really knew that this was going to be much worse or you knew it was going to be much better. Uh, and you're trying to take some tactical advantage. And so I, I look at this as defending companies and, and, and especially their officers too, the CEOs and CFOs and even the general counsels as to, you know, what's the, what's the right thing to be doing now. So I, I think, you know, and, and, and why John and I thought this was a great idea for, for a webinar is because this is the perfect time right now as we're going to, you know, get ready to make these filings and statements um, to go back and say, well, okay, here are the helpful things that, you know, the commissioner, the chairman has been saying, and, and, uh, and here are the, you know, not threatening, but, you know, mind, being mindful of the enforcement aspect of things. And what we want to do is, as John said, it's given over, but we really want to arm you by the end of this hour saying, like, well, here's what you can do. It's never going to be perfect, but it has to be reasonable and there has to be a lot of good faith. And so I think, you know, you have you, you have John Harrington, who has been inside corporation finance thinking what they're thinking. And I can tell you, you know, that there could be some Monday morning quarterbacking from the enforcement division in a couple of years, no matter what is said now, especially if there's a new chairman, new directors. You know what, what was said two years ago. Well, it, what's going to matter is the law. So, John. Yep. Um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I think um, I, I think this this is all helpful information for companies to look at and um, and and really think carefully about as they prepare their disclosures and their earnings releases. Um, but the other aspect of it is, you know, they're, they're sort of putting people on notice about what they expect and. And, you know, whether that leads to sort of in the short term, um, you know, corp fin comments or, you know, more significantly for a lot of people, enforcement actions down the road. Um, that's what we're concerned about. So let's take a look at some of these, um, some some of the statements and guidance that has come come out. We've pulled some quotes out to just kind of highlight some some key points. And so the first one that we have up on the slide is the statement from the co-directors of enforcement. Um, this was one of the earlier statements that came out. 
and I think it was, you know, in in the in the March time period when when this was accelerating very quickly, um, um, they reminded people about the use of material non-public information, obviously, um, as it relates to insider trading, and um, and also regulation FD and sort of um, the care that that companies and insiders have to take with respect to that material information. Um, and I think that was just, look, I think it was a warning. It was to say, okay, there's a lot going on, but don't for, don't forget these these sort of fundamental rules and, and we're gonna be watching. Right, and, and that's like, again, that's, it's, it's something they're gonna be, I think there's gonna be sympathy for companies that, um, don't have a crystal ball and can't tell exactly how, how this is going to impact, um, you know, their revenue projections, uh, their earnings, and you know their expenses. But um, there's certainly going to be no, um, there's going to be no sympathy whatsoever for people who, uh, off any insider who trades during this period of time. So, you know, if you're a, if if you're an insider thinking of trading, even at, you know after the company makes a disclosure and the window's open, I, I would highly urge the you know, the insider to get, get the advice of counsel um, that uh, both the both the general counsel of the company as well as individual counsel that they're, you know, that they're trading in a way which is consistent with the securities laws. Because even if um, you can, um, even if you, if you can, the trade's legal, the odds of being um, subject to an inquiry, I think would be very high. Yeah, and, 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 and that, that question, um, in terms of, you know, can insiders trade? Uh, you know, uh, I, to be honest, we got the question during March. Um, it, now, as we're kind of in a normal lead up to earnings, it's not as much of a live issue. But I think that is going to be something that companies struggle with um, following upcoming earnings. Um, and we're already starting to get questions about it um, in terms of whether or not the window can be opened because. You know, some some companies feel like their stock price has been is is way too low. It's been some of the selling has been indiscriminate, and and people want to buy. But it, as as John said, it's something that um, it's all facts and circumstances. Different companies have been impacted by this different ways, have different things going on. Um, but it's it's certainly something that um, everyone should be very careful about and think through um, with the with the advice of counsel. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so so the joint statement that came out from Chairman Clayton and the Director of Corp Fin um, just just last week. I'm losing track of time. Um, it was interesting in a lot of ways. Um, if I know people have limited time, but it, it's it's worth a read just because it was so different in terms of um, any type of um, guidance or public statements that that I've seen. Um, and there's a lot to it, but but the parts that are sort of I think most relevant um, to public companies as they go into this earnings season. Um, are, are sort of highlighted here. So the first, the first quote, um, they, they made the point uh, in this statement about current and forward-looking information potentially being much more important than historical information, um, which is which is not the normal circumstance. Um, so they they really urged um, companies to, to be thoughtful about um, disclosing, you know, how they've been impacted by the, the, the pandemic, what their current status is, what their response has been, what actions management has taken, what their plans are, and, um, and really be forward-looking in terms of, of what the outlook is. Um, obviously, that's, that's all easier said than done. And and that's 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 a real challenge, I think, for a lot of companies that are um, still, frankly, trying to kind of sort all this out in terms of um, 
how how they have been impacted. Um, but the other side of it is that they, you know, in sort of encouraging companies to be um, forthcoming with with forward looking disclosure and really be sort of proactive and kind of getting all the information out there that might be material to investors is a reminder that um, there are these safe harbors for forward looking information and companies um, should take advantage of those and that they the SEC is not going to um, second guess good faith attempts to to provide appropriately framed forward looking information. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this 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 point so um how do you how do you what is the safe harbor for forward-looking statements and how do you best take advantage of it in these circumstances um but if we can go to the next slide because i think the the so the so the corp fin statement disclosure topic number nine um it was very very kind of similar in message i think to the to that joint statement um and you can see from from some of these quotes as well so um in, in the second bullet i think encouraging companies to provide disclosures that allow investors to evaluate the impact through the eyes of management um and proactively re revise and update as facts and circumstances change so this sort of the through the eyes of management um guidance i mean that language has been in MDNA guidance in in the past and around for a long time, and I think that kind of goes to the core of what the SEC expects in MDNA or or analysis of of earnings. Um, pro proactively revising and updating disclosures um, is is also it, that's a little different, right? Because we don't have a continuous disclosure system here. We have periodic and current reporting, um, and you know the the duty to update you know prior statements is um, it, it's it's fuzzy. I mean, there, there there's case law about it. It's it's to the extent it exists, it's a pretty limited obligation but here you have you know corp fin telling companies to proactively revise and update disclosures so it, it's a different it's a different situation um so so let's stop there and and talk a little bit about forward looking statements in terms of what um what 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 companies should be doing and maybe doing now differently um in terms of trying to maximize the protection from these safe harbors. So, first of all, it, just a reminder, I mean, there are situations where forward-looking statements are, are required. Um, MDNA, known, known trends and uncertainties, risk factors. Um, so, this is an area where it's not just sort of voluntary disclosure because the staff wants it. it there, there are some requirements that you have to consider. But in terms of the what is a forward-looking statement and, and what is eligible for the safe harbor, it has to be clearly identified as a forward-looking statement, accompanied by meaningful cautionary language and, and factors which could cause results to materially differ. Um, and, and and it has to have a reasonable basis, right? It has to be made in good faith with a reasonable basis. So, you know, in the normal course of things, there's a, you know, in an earnings release or somewhere in, in a 10K or 10Q, there's, you know, there's this list of sort of bullet point factors that could cause results, um, results to differ. Um, you know, we try to be careful about framing things appropriately by saying, you know, we expect this or we expect that. Um, I think it, in this circumstance, because there's so much uncertainty, um, I think we really are urging companies to not use boilerplate or, or even depart from the framework. So, you know, instead of putting the disclaimer at the end, that, you know, you may need some language in the body of the release that talks about 
what your assumptions are, um, what some of the contingencies are, and and even somewhat you know stating the obvious that you know you're operating in an unprecedented situation with lots of uncertainty. Um, so there's no, I mean, there's no, there's no blanket answer. Um, obviously, everyone's facts and circumstances will dictate. But we are urging companies to really be thoughtful about how um, how the how this disclosure is put together this quarter because it's it's just it's just so different. Um, on, on the prior slide, the, the highlighted language about, you know, the staff won't second guess. The key, key language in there to me was appropriately framed. Um, and so that means more. And then John, yeah, and, go ahead. And John, doesn't, aren't they really, and, and just, just to drive that point home too, because, you know, you look at these incredibly positive statements that we're all in this together and, you know, we're not going to second guess things. And we, you know, I kind of said in the beginning, like, look, there, there'll be new people in the office and, and they'll second guess or they won't. But just to be clear, I mean, as, as you say, with MDNA, you have to disclose trends, events, and uncertainties. And there's a massive uncertainty about what Corona is. And they're not saying, so that, that's just to be clear, that's not optional. That's mandatory, isn't it? Yes. Right. So in a way, and, and there, I don't, and is there, is there a safe harbor? I don't think there is. Is there a safe harbor for MDNA when you're, you know, if it's just a regular MDNA and they're compelling, compelling you to disclose? Well, there, it, if it's, it can be a forward looking, if it is a forward looking statement within MDNA, um, you can get the benefit of this, of the safe harbor, you know, certainly not um, the entire MDNA. Right, but it, so I guess, I guess it, as you say, you can't, if you have fact-based, one of the challenges, I think, and you know, we'll talk about this, in a little, but I might as well start with the theme now, is what you can do is this whole thing going back to when the chairman said good faith, like what the, what the heck does that mean exactly? And we'll have a definition for you later in the deck. Um, but you, if now is the time you, you lay the predicate and you're laying the foundation for establishing you know, the good faith when you're with your clients or when you're, you're, if you're the general counsel and you're doing this, it's 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 almost like yes you're going to need to have everything you know from you know from emails and, and other documentation external reports and things like this to have that there because when they're talking about good faith and reasonableness and which is where i come in years later when it's they're they're saying management was unreasonable or they didn't act in good faith and so i think that you're you're looking at all this and you know and and, and you know i'll go back to you back to you now to talk about it but it's it's, it's not only important that you do it it's kind of important that you document it yeah, and so uh, in a couple of slides, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the, this, this, the process here coming into earnings. Um, but I just want to touch on this sort of this, this urging companies to, you know, proactively revise and and update. Um, that 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 is that is different um, than the normal course, and um, there may be numerous reasons why companies may do that but i think that's this is an area where it's very tricky you know the the sort of the case law and when there is a duty to update forward looking statements in, in in the securities laws is 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 not clear to me it's 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 pretty limited and you know i i do this for a living obviously i would struggle to sort of draw clear lines about when it when it exists um now in the face of um you know uh, we keep saying this but i think it's it's fair but unprecedented and, and rapidly changing and rapidly evolving situation um when um you know when something you said a week ago could be completely out of date um that that's that's a, that's a real challenge so i i think um it ties into the forward-looking statements safe harbor in that I think making clear when you're giving your outlook or giving your expectations or giving your plans, you know, what what the what the relevant um, uncertainties are, what the assumptions are, <coughs> are are very helpful. So you so you don't have a legal duty to sort of update every single day i mean i will say sort of some of the some of the case law on the duty to update is 
you know, the, the, some of the language that's used in the cases is, you know, does the forward looking statement sort of imply a continuing representation that would remain alive in the mind of a reasonable investor? And so, you know, more specific and factual things um, in are maybe more likely to sort of lead to an obligation to update. Um, so, you know, think about things that are in control of the company. So, you know, we plan to do this, you know, it, it, here's a uh, severe example, but, you know, if if you're saying we're planning to sell the company and then you make a decision that you're not planning to sell a company, well, that may be a duty to update. Um, but but in any case, what, what the SEC is sort of urging here, I think, is um, kind of above and beyond that. Um, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so the, so the, the Corp Fin disclosure kind of listed, um, it was sort of a laundry list of, of things to consider um, as, as companies um, provide disclosure about the impacts. And um, the list was much longer in, in the guidance than this bullet, um, but it, it's really everything. And obviously it depends on, on the company um we can go to the next slide um so just 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 to really briefly here the other thing that um the corpvin guidance touched on was was non-gap and key performance indicators and the upshot i think there is that the, the normal rules still apply uh there's there's going to be some flexibility um particularly to reconciliation to estimates but um, companies are still expected um, to comply with their obligations. And returning to a, to a consistent theme, they, they, they reminded companies again to be cautious about insider trading and regulation FD. So, so, so John, on, on that point, though, for the non-GAAP measures, it, it would seem to me that this would be um, a situation where um, the temptation uh, to go to non-GAAP would be incredibly high because you know in in the cases in my in my experience it's if management's desire to say hey we are really a healthy company a really a vibrant company we have great prospects but our earnings right now don't show it because there is something which is an aberration completely unusual which is making us look uh making us look uh you know as if um as if we're uh much, uh, maybe even going concern, or certainly much less profitably, or, or that our, our, our losses are greater than they appear. And so, you know, I, I could only imagine that for, you know, for a, a company that is in, been in the food industry. Uh, I know that farmers were dumping, you know, millions and tens of millions of gallons of milk um, because they could not get them to market in, uh, in, you know, in this environment with limitations because of uh, COVID-19. It would seem to me, am I, am I right, John, is this a situation where you'd be, you know, if you would exclude COVID-related, you know, losses, we would have had EPS consistent of not greater than historical results. I think that, are, are you seeing that? Is that something that management could attempted to do? I, I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I think there will be temptation, but, you know, I think the staff will be flexible in terms of the types of adjust, adjustments that relate to COVID in terms, you know, Things like significant charges, um, um, impairments, write-offs, things like that. But you you can't recreate business that didn't exist. You can't um, you can't make things up. There's just um, so it, I, look. I don't. I I I think there's going to be an urge to kind of show what would business would have looked like if you know things continued how they had gone in January and February. Um, but I, I, I don't think this is a time to get too creative because, you know, the, if the business wasn't there, you can't you can't extrapolate and create it. Um, now, I you know, a few years ago, this was a big non-GAAP was a big priority for the SEC to, from both Corpfin and enforcement perspective. Um, a few months ago, before um, this situation arose, they had put out. Um, guidance on the use of key performance indicators. So, um, you know, like things like operating statistics that aren't financial measures, but but similar 
rules apply. So it's clearly something they're still concerned about, and I think they're going to be flexible um, to a degree in this situation. Um, but you, but I I would advise companies not to get too aggressive here. Right, and and it's, and it's a point that I'll I'll, I'll make uh, I might have made once already today, but I'll continue to make is that. Even if the um, uh, the commission and the staff, you know, have this more relaxed approach to enforcement, given the extraordinary circumstances, there's no way plaintiffs' attorneys are going to give companies and officers the same path. Uh, and when this washes, this washes out, and a year from now, when all of the you know the crisis is hopefully forgotten, um, you'll see people. I think there'll be an tr tr absolutely tremendous number of of private and class action suits against issuers and senior officers because of all of this, you know, from all of this, you know, from forward looking statements, MDNA and, and from, you know, non gap. So again, I think, I think it's critical to, to, uh, to, you know, keep your head in this situation right now, understanding there's a lot coming at you, but that there's going to be, there's going to be second guessing. And it, the, the only question is how do you best prepare for it? Yeah, and 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 I would one more point about the non-GAAP. You know, I think um, for 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 companies that have really been you know severely impacted by this, um, and this is consistent with the with the message of of some of the SEC guidance that has come out. You know, it, I think the focus should be on what do things look like right now. What do things look like going forward? Clearly, companies are going to report historical results because they have to um but if 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 your results for the first quarter were um kind of severely impacted by um by the pandemic y you know there may be some value in sort of showing what the trends were like through through february or, or whatever the date is um but I think it's going to be relatively less important than sort of current status and sort of the go forward picture. Um, so, you know, consider the sort of, you know, pros and and, and uh, cons of of being aggressive um, in terms of presentations. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just just is just. Um, acknowledging this SEC order that allows the delay of filings um, due through July 1st by up to 45 days. So companies do have the ability to delay their upcoming 10 Qs um, if they're unable to meet the deadline due to the COVID-related circumstances. Um, the one, one point here I'll make about this 8K that companies um, need to furnish if they're going to rely on this order um, it's mostly factual. What's the expected filing date? What are the reasons for the delay? But the last point, risk factors regarding impact of pan pandemic, um, reiterating what we've talked about already in terms of forward-looking statements. Um, this th this is a substantive thing in my view. I mean, this is something that should be given some thought, um, should be tailored to, this, to the company, um, and, and really be done in a way that is not um, generic, but that that is useful. Um, and in the in the order, again, consistent with the themes of, of some of the other stuff that's come out, um, there was even a footnote um, that that indicated that these these risk factors would be subject to the um, the forward looking statement safe harbor um, if they were appropriately framed. Um, OK, next slide. All right, so I think we'll get into um, a little bit of what some of the questions that that we've been getting and and some of the um, some of the considerations here. So first, in terms of timing and process, you know, should companies update the market prior to their regularly scheduled earnings? Um, a lot of companies have. Um, I think that. Um, it, th th that can be driven by a lot of things. I mean, it can be, um, you know, there's just a, a vacuum of information, um, questions that com companies were getting, um, particularly a few weeks ago, um, 
you know, a, a concern that the market price of, of your stock is, is, isn't reacting correctly to sort of what's going on, um, actions taken by peers, you know, a transaction you need to do, AK item, whatever. There could be lots of reasons. Um, and we've seen a lot, a lot of companies do this. Um, so I don't, you know, I think it's all driven by facts and circumstances. Um, as we get closer to regularly scheduled earnings, it probably be becomes less of um, less of a question. Um, the other, so the other question, so should companies delay their 10 Qs um, as permitted by the extension order? Um, I, you know, I think I don't, I don't, I personally don't know yet. I haven't been able to get a sense for how um, widespread this this will be. I, I, I have talked to clients that um, expect to do it, but and I've talked to others that that don't see any problems filing their 10 Qs on time. So um, it, it very much depends on um, on the company, their circumstances, how difficult it will will it be for them to file on time. Um, uh, you know, it it's just it it's 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 a it's a balancing of sort of you know if if you if you delay your 10Q then it doing an earnings release on the regular timeline which I think most companies will do even if they delay their 10Q is is challenging probably more challenging than usual um, the longer you delay your 10Q there there's you know, more subsequent events to think about. Um, you know, there's concern about market reaction if 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 a company winds up doing it and some of their peers don't. Um, and then on the other side of it is, you know, people are working from home. There's there's been a tremendous disruption, chaos. Um, there are some very difficult um, judgments that need to make be made for some of these accounting estimates. Um, and and people are. A lot of times, the people responsible for doing that are doing lots of different things as 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 um, as companies try to try to address the situation. You know, not just in their disclosure, but in their business. So, um, obviously, if, if if you don't feel comfortable filing your 10Q on time and finalizing your financials, this can be very valuable. So, um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's something that we'll continue to have discussions with our clients about, and and hopefully in the next week or so. Um, two weeks or so, we'll 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 see more AKs and and start to get a sense for how widespread it will be. Um, so the last question, I mean, if companies delay 10 Q, should they release earnings on schedule and hold typical earnings call? I think most companies, the answer will be yes. I mean, the SEC um, statements and guidance were certainly urging companies to to um, to disclose as much as they possibly can. Um, so I think in most cases. The answer to that would be yes. Um, all right, next slide. So this is just this slide is just a lot of the, the things companies are are wrestling with. I mean, all of these disclosures are are, are very challenging, um, and um, require require a lot of thought. I mean, when I, I when you look about, you know, the SEC wants to disclose forward-looking information and really sort of be forthcoming. Um, one of the things that I think is helpful, at least to me, is to sort of break it down in, in terms of historical. So you have to disclose that. Um, so companies will continue to disclose that. We talked a little bit about that in terms of non-GAAP. Um, current. So what's your current status in terms of financial condition, operating? Um, operating status, you know, are your stores open? Are your factories operating? Can you get supplies? Can your employees work? Those types of things. Um, I, th I think that's going to be very important. And, and I, I would say current means in this situation as, as current as um, as possible at the time of the earnings release or the, or the call, not necessarily looking back to the last balance sheet date. So if you're if you're a company in an industry that's been you know that's really can't operate in the current situation, um, the the market is going to be very concerned with um, financial viability. So you know how much cash do you have at, at at the most recent date? What are what are the what are your usage rates? How much, what's your cash burn rate in you know not 
not uh, in March, but really, you know, the last, the, the most recent week in April, things like that. Um, so John, so John, let me, let me ask you. So um, one of the things, and those all things make, those things make perfect sense, but imagine if you had, a, if you had a client who was in the food service business and in, uh, and, a, and not a, not a primarily takeout business. And so you have the situation where their stores are closed. Maybe they're doing a little bit of takeout. We're talking about, you know, companies that are, you know, one, 200 stores around the nation big, maybe anchored in, anchored in malls and things like that. But, you know, so certainly those metrics about, you know, you know, cash burn rates, resources, covenants, those things are, are those things are existing and get your arms around those things because, you know, you should, your finance team inside the company should know that. But what about like, what about, you know, like, I, I would also think companies now would be like, all right, so if we're going to have to live with social distancing, how is social distancing going to impact the actual business of our business? Are, we're, are we going to, if you're, I've heard the mayor of New York and maybe the, uh, the governor of New York talk about like, well, even when restaurants open, they're going to have to be open at 50% of seating capacity. Every other table is going to have to disappear. I mean, do, do, do companies have to talk about that type of stuff or do you think that's too speculative? I, I think it's too speculative in a lot of cases. I think um, I think that um, I don't think it's it's the company's obligation to kind of make any sort of predictions about the direction the pandemic's going to go, or or you know what type of go government government responses regulations are going to remain in place in the long term. So that piece, that kind of longer term outlook, is is clearly the hardest part of this but i think if, if you combine if you combine um you know some some good disclosure about your your current situation and status um some good disclosure about actions that the company is taking so what are management's plans um and 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 good you know risk factors and cautionary disclosures about you know how you might be impacted by various uncertainties and contingencies i think that can take the pressure off the 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 the, the feeling the need to sort of make some of these predictions because i, I think in a lot of cases it's, it's just too hard and it's just too speculative so if you give good clear transparent disclosure about you know how you've been impacted how you look right now what 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 you're doing um then, then that can get the investors a lot of way there to sort of make their own judgments. Right, but I guess I guess that's true. If you're, I guess maybe they can burn. But if you're, I would think any good company is doing modeling internally just to say, hey, these are, you know, you know, of course we say closed. That's kind of easy to figure out the burn rate. But if we could only partially open or operate in a new environment, I would think if I was, I have a lot of former colleagues from the U.S. Attorney's Office who are plaintiffs lawyers. They would point to that and say the company had at this time, they had internal models saying that they, they were aware that there was a significant probability that they would not be able to come into full business for at least two years and only operate at 50% of capacity. So are you telling, you know, our, our clients, you know, I, I guess you have to be mindful of that. Do you have advice for clients? Like, should they be doing that or should they be making sure that those things are marked as, you know, hypotheticals or what, would you, what advice would you give? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, companies have all sorts of models and I don't think, you know, in the normal course, they don't disclose their models and, and I don't think these circumstances change that. Now, like with any other sort of materiality judgment, I mean, I think, I think you have to kind of evaluate sort of, um, you know, the, the sliding scale of, you know, the likelihood of something to happen and the significance and, and, and and think about that i mean if if all your models are pointing to one outcome then well yeah then i think you, you, maybe you don't disclose the model but you you, you got to warn about that outcome um right but if you're doing modeling to to account for various contingencies and you really have no idea what's going to happen then you know i don't view it as you have to disclose all those potential outcomes um and and to, to the last point, I think, and, and I think this is a broader point that we should discuss a little bit, is just um, make, having a good process and having a good record for all of this, right? I mean, it ties into having, you know, showing that you have a reasonable basis for a forward-looking statement, to showing that it's made in good faith. Um, um, if, if you go through a good process and, and you sort of create a good record, so 
you know, if it is truly, you know, you're modeling different scenarios, um, you know, make sure you're you're clear internally in terms of what those are, and it's not, you know, this is our prediction for the rest of the year. Um, but but what I mean, what, John, what do you think in terms of if 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 a company does get enforcement interest down the road? I mean, what are the most helpful things they can do to kind of build that good record? Yeah, I think we can get there. So I see where where we got about 15 minutes left. Let's let's jump down. We're going to get to jump down a couple of slides. Can we jump down to the first uh, the Walgreens case, Kristen? Sure. First, the for those case, yeah, yeah, yeah. for Go those ahead. requesting CLE credit, please record the code one BH two zero two zero for the post program evaluation. So please make sure to write this code down if you're requesting CLE credit as you'll be asked for it at the conclusion of this program, 1BH2020. Okay, so let's go down, let's go down to the Walgreens one, because we could kind of talked about, so there's a number, of, there's a number, like we said, we talked about, and back up one, perfect. We talked about, you know, the fact that it's the MDNA, it's the forward-looking statements, it's um, safe harbors in the PSLRA, um, all of those things are kind of like what, what's pushing the disclosure. And I thought what would just be interesting for people to see, this really does matter because if, if we just picked a couple of cases. So, you know, when companies say too much and they don't correct what they said, the SEC will sue. So Walgreens got sued in September uh, of, of 2018. And what the, the problem there is that, you know, they had come out with a, a projection which they knew was not sustainable. And over multiple reporting periods, the you know, senior Walgreens executives, mis, you know, courting the SEC misled investors about the company's public financial goals. And so um, what, you know, in, in this case, they find the company, you know, $34.5 million penalties and uh, went, after the, went after the senior officers. What they were saying here is that, you know, Walgreens, the former CEO and CFO, repeatedly publicly affirmed the projections without adequately disclosing increased risk. You might also note former. Uh, because the individuals tend to lose tend to lose their jobs. So here's an example of where you're you're making a statement about projections, but you've lost you've lost the basis, the good faith basis for what you're what you're saying. You don't correct something that's out there, and so the SEC could say, okay, so here's an example where it, you say too much and you don't correct, and it's an issue. Uh, next slide. So the next slide is is, is cloud communications, and um, and in that situation, it's, it's the same type of saying too much continued, where the company was aware of red flags, which um, undermined the first quarter 2015 revenue estimates, um, and, and including that you know Sonos had pulled forward deals initially projected to close in 15 in order to you know kind of channel stuffing, as some people would refer to it, to achieve its revenue guidance for the fourth quarter of 2014. Um, you know, in, in that situation, um, you know, it was it was pretty clear that they were going to have a pretty big miss, uh, and they, you know, they had uh, 74 million dollars as originally projected, and they came in between 47 and 50, big drop in the price stock. You know, company executives had to settle with the SEC, um, and, and and here is the tough talk from Antonio Chian, who's one of the uh, 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 former associate directors, is that now they're going to say the investing community expects when the company chooses to provide public financial projections that there's a reasonable basis underpinning those projections. So we're going to talk about it in a minute, but we get the quotes around reasonable basis is what you're thinking now as, we, as you're working with your clients or your company to figure out what you're going to say. You can think good faith, you can think reasonable basis. So um, uh, we'll go to uh, Diageo, which is the next slide. Uh, in that situation, um, you know, the SEC flipped and said, uh, we're going to charge this public company for failing to make required disclosures of known trends relating to the shipments of what they believed unneeded products by North American subsidiaries. So here's a situation where they weren't making uh, positive disclosures uh, that which were what our basis, but there, there, was a, there was a trend here which the SEC believed clearly existed that they were they didn't need the they didn't need the product and uh, in this situation there was some you know facts that Diageo pressured distributors to take more products than they needed creating misleading picture of the company's financial results and ability to meet key performance indicators so again another I'll tell you as a trial attorney and somebody who deals with regulators and prosecutors and judges and juries all the time it's the this concept of you know a misleading picture so um, you know and when we'll what we're going to have to get to is like I would ask, and I always tell my clients, you know, 
if you're sitting in the C-suite and you feel, you know, that, you know, the things are, you know, things are a seven on 10 or a five on 10 and where we're going to be rosy, it's like, does the outside world have the same information? And they're going to have everything that you have. But I mean, do they have it? Are, are they seeing a really true picture? Because I'll tell you, as a trial attorney, uh, no jury cares if it's uh, regulation SK, SX, um, whether it's PSLRA or anywhere. What they care about is do they think the company misled people? Do they think the officers misled people? And that's, you know, that's kind of, that's uh, what, basically what your, um, what your Aunt Sally, who sits on a jury, would think. And, and unfortunately, these things do go to jury trials. Maybe the case that um, is kind of like most on point is the Bank of America case, if we go there. So this goes back to um, the financial crisis of 2008, when you know John Harrington was actually sitting in um, Division of Corporation Finance, so it, that was all his fault. Yeah. Um, so, so in, in that case, Bank of America admitted that it failed to inform investors during the financial crisis about known uncertainties to future income. And so, the 2008 financial crisis, for those who are in, in the market, most of you were, remember how creepy that was and how funny that felt and how companies were kind of looking for, you know, their traction to figure out, you know, how, what's the path forward exactly with liquidity crisis and all the bank failings. This is so much worse. Uh, th this is, there's so much, there's so much greater uncertainty here, but here it is. And, and, and if you look at important, look at the date, August 21, 2014. I mean, it's, 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 five plus years later uh, that they actually brought this. And that's what's going to happen here with, with, you know, with Corona. It's going to be years later um, that they're going to be, you know, coming out to the same place and saying, oh, well, goodness, you should have, you should have done better. You should have done, you should have done uh, different things. Um, so, and let's, let, let's go to, we're going to get to the, what you should do in a second, but one, let's go to the insider trading slide, please, Kristen. So the former VP employee, here's somebody who um, was inside the company uh, who sold his family's stake in BP, uh, BP Securities after he received confidential information about the severity of the oil spill. Same thing that the public, that the public didn't know. Same exact principle going on here. Are your clients, are um, people that you work with or friends and family in, inside of public companies where they know better than just, hey, there's a general concern about, you know, Corona. What's this really going to mean for the future from technology, from workforce, from shipping, from being able to deliver? Um, they will certainly, they will certainly, you know, uh, be very aggressive in my mind, you know, going after. And, 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 and the next slide, the, one of the things that um, the Norwegian Cruise Line, please, is so we've been kind of looking at to say, hey, what's kind of happened already? So already, only months ago, and this is, of course, still for plaintiffs, but the plaintiffs are already looking to sue Norwegian Cruise Lines because they believe that uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines was making false statements to their passengers to induce them to book cruises when they knew there was, it was not safe and there was a, you know, the plaintiff's alleged this, uh, that it was not safe um, and that um, those bookings, they would have those bookings. And so if we go to the next slide, some of the, some of the things that were being said, um, you know, about, you know, the only, that manager said, go tell this to the passengers. All you need to worry about is your cruise, your sunscreen. Uh, you know, scientists and medical professionals have confirmed that warm weather will be the end of coronavirus. Uh, you know, so take a, cru take a cruise because it can't stand, you know, it survives in cold temperatures. Um, you know, all of these things, which, you know, we'll say didn't really have a really good basis in scientific fact, but was it done to induce passengers falsely, done, which created a false financial picture for Norwegian Cruise Lines, and so hence the lawsuit. I, I will tell you, in my experience, this is the this is going to be the first of uh, of, a, of a million of these types of things. And um, next thing, whistleblowers. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want you to grab one fact. The the fact is that there is a stunning amount of referrals. You know, SEC received over 5,200 whistleblower referrals in fiscal year 2019. So they're constantly doing that. And that does matter because inside of public companies, there are whistleblowers, a tremendous number, and they're going to be saying, hey, this company's not telling the truth about this. Hey, we're not gonna, we're not getting, our, our products are not safe. Hey, we can't ship our products. Things which are going to, uh, are gonna cause a problem. So all of this gets to, and I'm going fast because of the time, um, demonstrating good faith. Uh, and that's a, a slide up. And so when, when Clayton stated, you know, good faith attempts to, you know, good, the good faith attempting, as a trial lawyer, I go back and, as, and, and, and John Harrington, as a counselor of public companies, has to say now, 
you know, what does that mean and how do you prove it? So, you know, good faith generally is, you know, is defined as state of mind consisting of honesty and belief of purpose, faithfulness to duty or obligation, observance of reasonable commercial standards or fair dealing in absence of intent to defraud or seek unconscionable advantage. That's Black's Law Dictionary. But for now, it will give you a pretty good, um, a, a pretty good, um, you know, uh, definition for what you have to do. And so then really, Next slide. And this is where we're going to dwell and talk about it for the next five minutes so we're out of time. How do you demonstrate good faith? You know what I mean? So, I mean, when, when, when a public company calls John Harrington, who has spent, you know, half a decade uh, in, in the Division of Corporation Finance and does this every single day, the fact that if I ever had to defend the company as an advocate, I would say, I would say, like, what do you want experience? These people make ball bearings. These people make thermometers. These people, you know, are in the, are in the airline business. They go to people, formerly your people in you know, SEC, and ask them. And so um, I think it's, it's it, but you want the in-house people to opine and you want external counsel. And why external counsel? Not just because um, we're external counsel, but because we see other companies every day. We're in before the SEC every day. You know, John Harrington's on the phone with them every single day. Uh, I'm in depositions with them, trying cases, settling cases. So we know what they're going to think. And we know, I will tell you, that advice of counsel is an amazingly strong pushback. Because again, I always talk about my Aunt Sally, you know, my mythical Aunt Sally and the jury. If you say to the juror, well, we asked, you know, good lawyers, and they said this was, this was right. Uh, follow design policies and procedures. You know, critically important, you can't deviate, because we'll look for deviation, the SEC will look for deviation, DOJ will look for deviation, plaintiffs look for deviation. If there's a process that we bubble up the information, you know, make sure that that's followed. If there's a process for vetting the information, make sure that's followed. Um, you know, and this this is again the diligence in gathering information from the corporation. I believe is is heightened. Um, and so, you know, so I don't. Know, so, John, are you are you telling? I mean, I mean, I guess this is highly unusual. So, it, it's not. You, you'll agree with me. It's not enough to just do the same old type of you know looking around the corporation for information. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean. So, what do you? What are you telling clients? I, I think that uh, the, a couple things. One is I, I, I just I think clients need to they need to stick with their you know established policies and procedures, but um, you need to look out for weaknesses in those that due to you know everyone's working from home. Um, you, you just need to be careful that things aren't breaking down because. Um, because of because no one's together because everyone's remote um and i also think that you know i think public companies and and, and the lawyers and accountants and um ir and financial reporting all the people that work on these kind of quarterly disclosures there, there's, a, there's a normal cadence and process um but my concern is that um some of these issues are going to be so challenging because of all this uncertainty um, that that things may need to be accelerated a little bit, both accelerated and also kind of um, expanded, just because you're going to be dealing with challenging situations and things are going to be changing so quick that the normal process is probably not going to be sufficient. Um, so making sure there's open communication between all the parties within within the company and and the outside advisors that need to be involved and and making sort of sure that those kind of lines of communication communication stay open you know from from yeah, now to make the disclosure i i think i think that's right and 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 the last thing and because you're we're bumping right against the clock his message discipline. So if you if you watch if you watch you know Governor Cuomo lately, where you know he wants he had a message, he makes the message. If, if people ask questions, if people are asking the CEO, the chair, CFO's questions and earnings calls, there has to be discipline in the message. There has to be not because you're trying to avoid um, you know giving an answer, but because you're trying to give a consistent answer, and that that answer that you're giving is backed up by documented um, evidence inside the company, advice of counsel, advice from CPAs that there is a there is a solid reasonable basis that what they were saying was reasonable based upon facts and done in good faith and and i think that's so Kristen, it's two o'clock are we out of time we are um so if you're 
If you're requesting CLE credit, please record this second code to um, be 2020 for the post program evaluation. And please make sure to write down this code if you're requesting CLE credit, as you'll be asked for it um, once we close out of the webinar to BH 2020. So given that we're at time, we will do our best to address any questions that came in throughout the webinar via a follow-up email to all of the attendees. And concluding today's program, there will be a short questionnaire immediately following this webinar. So for those of you requesting CLE credit, please make sure you fill this out. Once the webinar ends, a small box will appear that reads the webinar has ended with an OK button. Simply click the OK button and the CLE form will appear in your browser. Any additional instructions for CLE in your state will be emailed to you. Should you have any questions, uh, please contact Kristen Gould at the email address at the bottom of your screen. Thank you again, John Harrington and John Carney, and thank you everyone for tuning in with us today and be well. Bye guys. Thanks.